Welcome to the 2016-17 NCAA Men's Basketball Media Fan Preseason Video. I'm J.D. Collins, the NCAA National Coordinator of Men's Basketball Officiating. The purpose of this video is to make you aware of the rules changes and or interpretations for the 2016-17 season. During this media fan video, we will review key plays from this past season and we will look at how the new rules or interpretations will impact how the game is officiated. We will also review plays in response to the Rules Committee's ongoing directive to reduce physicality to create freedom of movement. The goal of all of our officiating training is to develop a national style of officiating that will result in a consistent enforcement of the rules during the preseason, non-conference, conference, and tournament play. It is all of the stakeholders' desire to have the same play officiated the same way no matter what conference or geographic region the game is located. It is very important to me to begin this media fan video by acknowledging and thanking the coaches for significant adjustments last season. Arguably, the more than 25 rule changes and the directive to reduce physicality to create freedom of movement may have been the biggest set of changes the game has ever experienced. Coaches, officials, and coordinators embraced the new paradigm, changed habits, and carried the cause from the beginning of the season through the NCAA tournament. My hat is off to the coaches, officials, and coordinators for their efforts to improve the game we all love. First and foremost, the Rules Committee has directed the officiating community to continue the enforcement of the directive to reduce physicality to create freedom of movement in the following six areas. Physical post play, rebounding, hand checking, body bumping the ball handler, rule 10-1-4. Freedom of movement for players without the ball or cutters. Screening, make sure all screens are legal and offense initiated contact on legal defenders. While progress was made last season, the Rules Committee highlighted the need for specific attention to reducing physicality in the post and during rebounds. The post and rebounding physicality must be addressed. We will first look at post play. Officials are instructed to call the first foul. Call an offensive foul if the offensive post player has his arms straight out in an attempt to ward off his opponent and makes contact with him. Call a defensive foul if the defensive player swim strokes or lays on an opponent. If these two actions happen at the same time, call a double foul per the rules of the game. Let's look at some plays. Oftentimes, during the initial meet and greet, one of the post players displaces the other. On this play, number 55 white displaces number 3 blue on the initial meet and greet. Number 55 white is correctly called for the first foul. On this play, number 15 black holds his left arm straight out to ward off his defender. Offensive players are allowed to shape up with elbows bent. When the offensive player uses a straight arm to ward off his opponent and makes contact with him, it should be called a foul. Number 15 black commits an offensive foul during this play. At the beginning of this play, number two white lays on the offense and reaches over with his left arm. This is a foul on number two white and should have been called. This play is typical of physicality increasing. At the beginning of this play, number 41 red holds off number one white with his right straight arm. This is the first foul and should have been called. The next action in the paint is number 41 red holding off number one white with his left straight arm and number one white swim stroking with his left arm. As the play finishes, it develops into uncontrollable physicality. This play has two occurrences of illegal action by both players simultaneously. In these situations, officials are instructed to call a double foul per the rules book.
Let's now turn our attention to rebounding plays. Officials are instructed to position themselves so that they can call obvious displacement on rebounds, including during free throws. Some rebounding plays are obvious displacement fouls. Others are less obvious, and still others are just tricks of the game. Let's look at some plays. This play is an obvious rebound displacement foul. Number 25 blue chucks number zero white to obtain a rebound. The center official or out official is in a great position to see and call this foul. This play is not as obvious, but has the same impact. Number 13 white chucks number 25 green and gains an advantage for his team. Officials are instructed to call displacement fouls during rebounds, even if it is a light chuck. Number four red chucks number one gold to obtain a rebound during a free throw. This is a foul. Officials will be adjusting their positioning during free throws to gain better angles on rebounding. This will increase the chances of getting this play right. Number 33 white hooks and holds the arm of number 22 black and pulls him away from the rebound. The hook and hold has become prevalent in our game. Officials are instructed to look for this type of technique and call the first foul. In this case, the first foul would be on number 33 white. During free throws, officials are instructed to look for players shoving from behind with forearms as well as with their lower body. This play is an example of this tactic. On both sides of the free throw lane, the offensive player in the second lane space pushes the player in the first lane space. Number zero red pushes number 11 white and number 13 red pushes number four white during this free throw. This illegal tactic allows number 13 red to secure the rebound. This is a foul on number 13 red. Officials are instructed to look for this type of illegal activity and call the first foul. During the 2015-16 season, officials did a solid job with the remaining four areas of reducing physicality. It is imperative that officials stay the course and continue to enforce the directive to reduce physicality to create freedom of movement. The Rules Committee issued three new interpretations that impact the game. The first is relative to when a coach may call a timeout. The coaching community gave significant feedback on last year's new rule, only allowing players to call timeout during a live ball. This year, the rule will be the same with one exception. On a throw in, the ball is live, and yet that team's coach will be able to be granted a timeout prior to the throw in being released. All other rules regarding timeouts will still be in effect. The second interpretation deals with the restricted area arc. If a defender starts in and remains grounded in the restricted area and there is sufficient contact for a foul, it must be a restricted area blocking foul, unless the contact is flagrant. Remember, if a defender is in or on the restricted area arc, he is considered to be in the restricted area. On this play, number 14 white drives to the rim. The secondary defender, number 32 blue, takes an illegal position in the restricted area. Since there was sufficient contact for a foul, this should have been a restricted area blocking foul last season. This play will remain a restricted area blocking foul in the 2016-17 season because number 32 blue is illegal and stays grounded in the restricted area. Number 24 white drives to the rim while the secondary defender, number three red, stays grounded in an illegal position in the restricted area. This play will remain a restricted area blocking foul this season. On this play, number two white drives to the rim. 
The secondary defender, number zero black, takes an illegal position in the restricted area. Since there was sufficient contact for a foul, this should have been a restricted area blocking foul last season. This play will remain a restricted area blocking foul in the 2016-17 season. Number zero black is illegal and stays grounded in the restricted area. Now let's look at a new legal action within the restricted area. If a secondary defender establishes initial guarding position in the restricted area, jumps straight up in the air with his hands vertically raised within his vertical plane and attempts to block a shot, this will no longer be a restricted area play. This play will be officiated like any other play anywhere on the floor. Coaches refer to this action as walling up and will be considered a legal play in 2016-17, as long as the defender maintains all of the principle of verticality requirements found in Rule 4, Section 38. On this play, number 13 blue drives to the rim. Number 42 white, while in the restricted area, jumps straight up in the air with his hands vertically raised within his vertical plane and attempts to block the shot. This will be a legal play during the 2016-17 season. This play will be officiated like any other play anywhere on the floor. On this play, number 44 White legally defends two shots while jumping in the air from the restricted area. It is important to note that if a defensive player does not maintain the principle of verticality or doesn't attempt to block the shot, they are at risk of being called for a blocking foul. This play will be officiated like any other play anywhere on the floor. This is an example of a player, number 50 red, maintaining his vertical position while off the ground and attempting to block the shot. Even though he starts from the restricted area, this is a legal play by number 50 red. This play will be officiated like any other play anywhere on the floor. In contrast, this last verticality play is of a player not maintaining his principle of verticality while off the ground. Number 12 red drives to the basket and number 12 white jumps in the air from the restricted area. Number 12 white's left arm is within his vertical plane. However, number 12 white's right arm is horizontal or parallel to the floor. Because number 12 white does not maintain the principle of verticality, this will be called a normal blocking foul on number 12 white. The third interpretation involves the vertical cylinder in normal basketball moves. Let's look at the rule. Rule 4, Section 38, Verticality. Article 1. Verticality applies to a legal position and also to both the offensive and defensive players. The basic components of the principle of verticality are the offensive player, whether on the playing court or airborne, shall not clear out or cause contact that is not incidental. The defender may not belly up or use the lower part of his body or arms to cause contact outside his vertical plane. The offensive player must be allowed enough space to make a normal basketball play. The defense may not invade the vertical space of the offense and make illegal contact when the offensive player is attempting a normal basketball play. Last season, by interpretation, a normal basketball play by the offense was defined as attempting to shoot, pass, or start a dribble. 
By interpretation this season, an offensive player holding the ball may make a normal basketball play by moving the ball low or below his waist from one side to the other, or by moving the ball high or above his shoulders from one side to the other. When an offensive player holding the ball at chest level or between his waist and his shoulders moves the ball from one side to the other, he is at risk of being called for an offensive player control foul when contact occurs. It is important to note that officials are instructed to look at the forearms of the offensive player. When an offensive player holding the ball moves the ball from one side to the other and his forearms are more vertical up to the ceiling or down to the floor than horizontal or parallel with the floor, this will be considered part of a normal basketball play. When the offensive player's arms are more horizontal or parallel with the floor than vertical, he will be considered to be clearing space and is at risk of an offensive foul. It is also important to note that if an offensive player is making a normal basketball play, any contact that is sufficient to be a foul must be a foul on the defense for invading the vertical cylinder of the offensive player. Please note, if the offensive player makes contact that is excessive or unnecessary, he still will be at risk of causing a flagrant one or flagrant two foul. The creation of the vertical cylinder for the offense was intended to allow the offensive player to have freedom of movement during a normal basketball play. This means that the defender cannot invade the vertical cylinder of the offense and make contact by crowding him while he attempts to make a legal move. On this play, number 22 White makes a normal basketball play by bringing the ball low from one side to the other. Number two black invades the vertical space of number 22 white. This is a defensive foul on number two black. Number one blue makes a normal basketball play by bringing the ball high from one side to the other. Number five white invades the vertical cylinder of number one blue and is in an illegal position. This is a defensive foul, and unless the contact by number one blue is excessive or unnecessary, the elbow contact should be considered incidental contact. Note the offensive player's forearms are more vertical than horizontal. On this play, number 20 gold makes a normal basketball play by bringing the ball high from one side to the other. Number 14 green invades the vertical cylinder of number 20 gold and is in an illegal position. This is a defensive foul and unless the contact by number 20 gold is excessive or unnecessary, the elbow contact should be considered incidental. Note that the offensive player's forearms are more vertical than horizontal. After the rebound, number 35 white moves the ball from one side to the other at chest level. This move clears out number 23 blue and is not a normal basketball play by number 35 white. This is an offensive foul on number 35 white for clearing space. When an official calls a foul for violating the vertical cylinder of an opponent, he will stop the clock, give a preliminary signal, and then show the vertical cylinder signal in front of his body. A graphic of a defensive foul for vertical cylinder violation is shown on the screen. The offensive player may also be called for violating the vertical cylinder of the defense. The Rules Committee issued two additional focus points for officials. Number one, traveling on the perimeter and in the post. And number two, unsportsmanlike behavior.
This year, officials should focus on obvious travels, on resets of the feet on the perimeter, and footwork in the post. If a player catches the ball on the perimeter and resets his feet to shoot or pass, officials should call the traveling violation. This has become the norm in college basketball, and we must do a better job of calling obvious travels on the perimeter. Likewise, in the post, we must find the pivot foot. This will require additional movement by the center and trail officials. Oftentimes, players on the perimeter will reset their feet to prepare to shoot or pass. Officials will be instructed to focus on this type of illegal action. On this play, number zero black actually travels twice. First, he travels by resetting his feet on the initial catch just above the top of the key. And then second, when he resets his feet to square up to shoot. Officials should recognize that allowing this type of reset of the feet is an advantage and should be called a traveling violation. Number zero blue drives to the basket and travels. Not only did he get away with an illegal travel, but was rewarded with a shooting foul. The center and trail, or out officials, are responsible for traveling in the post. Officials and coaches did a great job last year of getting teams out of the huddles, replacing disqualified players, and dealing with injured players. The process of getting teams out of the huddle will remain a focus during the 2016-17 season. Bench decorum has become a concern over the last few years. We have to remember that coaches are allowed to spontaneously react to plays. Officials have been instructed to be approachable and communicate effectively. When coaches cross the line, literally or figuratively, it is the official's responsibility to draw the line with a clear and concise stop sign. Coaches should understand that at this point, it is their choice to cross the line. Officials should not make this personal. The net result of bad behavior by a coach is two shots for unsporting behavior and one shot for coaching box violations. This season, there will be a focus to make the optics of bench decorum a minor piece of our game. This media fan video is intended to assist the media and fans understanding of the rules of the game. There will be additional videos made available during the season to further educate and clarify key plays of the game. I hope this media fan preseason video assists in increasing your knowledge of the rules of the game. Thank you for your passion for the game we all love.